we it's just like catching up basically and just me finding out more about you so um and do you edit this and no. is it recording now it's recording now <laughs> so yeah no i don't edit so even that will be on there oh my god <laughs> oh my god do you want to hear a joke uh oh, i can't say no no so i went into a school and there was a f i spoke to a four-year-old boy and i couldn't believe he couldn't say thank you in spanish that's poor for four, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you that one. <laughs> no one's ever started this podcast out with a joke, mate. I only heard it this morning. Sorry. Mate, thanks for coming in. Um, I am friggin' excited to do this. Really excited. Really? Part of the excitement built um, from doing the study and the work when I was kind of like watching interviews that you were doing. You've done some crazy shit. Um, inspiring stuff. I can tell already you're just like, that's just, just what I do. But for me, who sits there, I've been working on my laptop for the last year and a half. So to, to watch someone who goes and explores parts of the world that you may never see, um, it's really inspiring and exciting. And uh, it's got me fired up. I want to do something. Really? Really. I find that, uh, I find that yeah, that's kind of normal. Mm. But I think through your work, yeah. you, sp you said to me already in the short five minutes that we met that you've interviewed over 50 people. And everybody's got a story. And I think, um, you know, we're, 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 I'm looking at now to a room full of people who've all got individual stories. Mm. And they're, it's, I think they're just inspiring. I understand my side because it's polar bears and ice and mountains and stuff. But um, everybody, everybody, you see people on the street, they've all got stories. Sure, but I think some stories relate more than others. Mm -hmm. So if there's something that you're doing that's in me that I want to do... It, okay. it, does that make sense? I do get that. Yeah. yeah so you're exp like, say you're going to the North Pole, the South Pole, walking across Iceland, and I'm like, fuck yes. So again, it, it, it you know, I have to look at that and go, why is it so exciting to me? You know, because I like adventures. I do small adventures, com you know, com in comparison to what you've done. But it's really kind of made me think, yeah, I want to do more because when someone lights you up like that, you've got to pay attention to it, don't you? Well, it's kind of it's kind of nice you say that because. Um, you know what I do is I, I just put it out there what I do and then people can gain from it how they want to so if they just want to you know watch me speak or look at some pictures or whatever that's great but some people are actually inspired to go you know what I'm going to buy a new pair of boots and get out there or I'm going to actually extend my normal walk and do Iceland or whatever mm. so it's it's kind of cool that people are inspired in different ways from it yeah and I, I've, like I said I've worked with a lot of guys who I've encouraged to do you know adventures like Snowden Nevis Scarfell mm. no one's ever regretted doing those adventures you know granted nothing terrible happens of course everyone seems to benefit mentally physically from putting on a backpack throwing on some shoes climbing a mountain being outside getting off your phone and I'm like we need to do more of this because it's good for us. It's good yeah. for our soul. I think if this was the end of the interview and you said, why do you do this? My answer would be, and will be if you ask me, um, is um, I want to reconnect people with the, the importance of the environment. Not only for your health, your, your physical and mental health, but the importance of actually how it, it um, affects the human race on a global mm. scale. So when you say going out and having a walk, it is great for yourself, but it's an appreciation of what's around us. Um, and just on a, a sort of the reason why, one of the, one of the other reasons why I do this is to um, encourage people to look at climate action, climate change um, from a different way, which we you can talk about if you like, but, um, but it, it is about looking on a local scale rather than on a global scale. It is a global problem, but, people get too overawed by the enormity of it and what they can't do about it as human beings, individuals, families who have to go to work nine to five, you know, what's our position on all of this? Well, it's a local scale for me. It's um, looking at your garden, what's immediately outside your door in, or inside your house and taking a pride in that. Um, so I try as an, and I am an ordinary person I'm from Coventry, you know, brought up in a normal sort of household. Um, and what I try to do through my films and through you know, platforms like this is to connect with people like me and say, this is why I explore and this is what I found out. Because mm. uh, in, the, in the beginning, I, I, I set off to do exploration through 
almost an egotistical point of view that I read the books of Ranulf Fiennes and other people and I wanted to have that photograph of me pulling the sledges. So I did that for six years and did you know quite a few expeditions but then I started to appreciate the environment and that's what changed my life and gave me direction. Yeah, but through the through the efforts that you made, right? So that's the journey, though, isn't it? It's like you go and do all those challenges, and then I think the lessons, maybe the appreciation, comes after. Because it was interesting when I, yeah. like, like I say, when I was watching your interviews, your language did change uh, over the years. You know, at first it was all about testing yourself, mm. which you did, and you kind of passed those tests, but you were still hungry. So the interview I watched with Stu Williams, who I know, when you did mm. it at Red Corner, that was <laughs> that was that was a few years back. That's you, a good interview. He's yeah, a he's nice a nice guy as well. Great, I've had him in here. He's oh, a really? brilliant guy. Yeah. yeah, I've known him for a long. I love him. I think yeah. he's great. Clever guy, smart guy. But you, yeah, it was all about you testing yourself and pushing yourself. And lately, some of the stuff I've been watching has been you about wanting others to discover themselves more, mm. to discover the world, to appreciate the world, to test mm. themselves. So I don't know whether you're getting as much satisfaction now from encouraging others, like myself, like, you know, I've watched what you've done, and I'm like, I want a piece of that. Mm. So it might inspire me to go and do something. Mm. And I'm wondering whether you get as much satisfaction from that, or if that might be a new goal of yours, to encourage others to do potentially what you've benefited from doing. I think everything that I've done <coughs> has been um, just fluid. So it's, I've never set out to, right, I'm going to do this. I've, you know, it's, uh, it's just joined, it's just sort of gone into, it's just sort of merged into each other, really, just through what I, I you know, people you want to work with, areas that you want to, why you want to explore, etc. It's just um, being self-employed, I can just sort of go, well, this is what I want to do. I didn't, I don't think that makes any sense, but... Um, yeah, I get a, a real satisfaction about speaking to people. I like quiet people in rooms. I like the people who sit at the back, and mm -hmm. I like those kind of guys. Um, I speak to everybody, but it's like just the ones. I d you know, on the way here, I'll tell you, tell you what, I don't know if this makes any relevance at all, but I was thinking about something on the way here. Um, <laughs> there, there's a school that I gave a talk to in Leamington, funnily enough. Okay. Um, and... I gave a talk in the school. They're really young kids, nine nine years old or something. This was a couple of years back. And um, the teachers said, you've got to dress as an explorer to them, not me, <laughs> to them that day. And nobody really made an effort apart from one girl. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I should say a name, but it's just one girl. She, well, her name's important because it rhymed with Dora, okay. which was really funny. And when she told me her name, it was really hilarious. Um, so... She dressed as an explorer, a little compass around her neck and all that. She's so enthusiastic about me coming in. And I took a photograph of her, giving a massive thumbs up, you know, to the camera. And it's a beautiful photograph. And at the end of the year, this was like in June, at the end of the year, I sort of sat down and was looking at all the pictures that I'd taken that year of Everest and, you know, working with Inuit and stuff like that. And some really nice pictures. And I thought, I'm going to run a competition with myself. And I'm going to choose my best photograph and... Whatever it is, whoever it is, I'm going to send them a book. Okay, it's just a signed book. And, and I looked at it, and she was the reason why I explore. Mm. Going into that school and seeing the enthusiasm. She didn't give a monkeys that she was dressed up and nobody else was. She was there to go, look at me. And I went into the school and um, just out on an off chance, and I went into the classroom and I says, hi guys, do you remember me? Yeah, yeah, like this. And I said, and I told him the story I've just told you. And I said, so uh, this is for you. So I gave her the book and that's why, that's why I explore. That's, that's why, the first reason why. Yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> and what I love even more is when there's some adults that still have that infectious passion. You know, like I say, they, they revert back to childhood when they see people like yourself. And, yeah. and maybe, I think you're aware of, of, of how much of an impact you can have on people, but... Uh, I'm certainly know that I, I struggle with that to think that anything I do would really influence kind of younger people or inspire younger people. But it, it, we, even as adults, we still have that inner curiosity to do the things that we wanted to do as a, as children. I think as you get older, you get that as well. I think I mean I'm 56 now, so as you get <coughs> older, you kind of you know you see things and you revert back to your past quite a lot. Mm. Um, I think. You know you get older as well or maybe maybe i'm just talking as an older person but i think people maybe nowadays they have more awareness of of people who walk past them and they have more of a 
a respect. There's a lot of that going around saying, do nice things, be respectful, understand that people have got their own troubles in their head. It might not look it, but yeah, yeah. you know, just have that sort of, and don't do it. What, what I, I, you know, things like TikTok and, it, and all that sort of stuff. I think it, you know, has a place. But one thing that gets me at the moment is when people are actually doing things in front of the camera, acts of kindness in front of the camera, going, "Look at me, have this money." And for me, that doesn't sit well. I think you should just be naturally kind to people naturally be that person and just you don't have to tell anybody about it you don't have to tell stories just do it as a part of the day do 10 of them if that's who you are mm. not one of them does that make sense it, it doesn't count in my opinion the, the acts of kindness if they're being filmed for, for that reason yeah it doesn't count i mean i've never been on tiktok still no <laughs> um, I, it, you know the, the counter argument to that would be it then creates this conversation and and then allows people to think oh actually i should be kind you know so it does have that visual impact it does but i think just naturally people people should just be good you know yeah. decent human beings start off with that it doesn't matter if you're poor rich or poor where are you from what you look like how big you are how small you are just be a decent freaking hood no i agree person. and the, the other counter is that the person on the end of that kind of still gets the 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 deed you know the, the gift rather it, whether it's being yeah. filmed or not. But I still think, yeah, there's a good argument to say it has to come from a genuine place, kindness. But kindness is something we can work on. A bit like the the argument you made for climate change about starting, you, you know, in, in your own small kind mm. of like world. I, I believe kindness starts there too. In any, any yeah. form of change. So Jordan Peterson, who I'm a huge fan of, always talks about this. Like, talk about fixing things in your own four walls. Mm. In you first. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of what the better man's about, really. It's about us working on ourselves so that we can have more of a positive impact mm. to our family and maybe if we're lucky in the community and then perhaps beyond that too mm. uh, but it all comes back to you starting with you doesn't it that's that's where you have to go it does um if i can give you a good example of why so um a few years back it was after the i think it was after the interview i did um that you mentioned um i um I did Everest. So I did the North and South Pole solo. And then when I came back, it was my intention to do Everest. But each of those expeditions wasn't just about the physical side of doing it, because we all know about those three areas and we all know people or read about people who've done it. So that wasn't the excitement for a viewer or for me, to tell you the truth. The challenge was there and I wanted that. But I linked with Skype in the early days when they were three years old. And they, I went into the offices, just walked in in London because I had this freaking great idea. And um, bless them, I got ignored quite a lot. In the reception, I got ignored. And it was my first time in my life that I actually threw a paddy in, um, in the reception. Um, and uh, I said, look, I've come all the way down here. And they went, OK, hang on. Um, so they got me a coffee, sat down, listened to my story. And I went, right, come and speak to the rest of the team. And that was an eight year relationship we had then. Mm. Uh, so in essence, what I did on Everest, I linked with 10,000 kids worldwide. And that's an actual number. And it was probably more than that of the knock on effect it had within the country. And these are, these are schools from uh, America, all the way around the globe, America, uh, Japan, um, you know, Scandinavian countries, UK, Australia, New Zealand. So they, all these kids were following this journey. And um, we were using Skype all the way from the UK to Kathmandu, all the way through the lower valleys, right up to base camp, and then doing ascent of Everest. Now, nobody had done this before, all right? Now, when I say that, you know, no one's done this before. I'm proud of actually saying that about this sort of thing, you know. Um, and then there's a great climber called Kenton Cool. And he saw me across the Lotsey face. And I never knew him. And he, he's a really famous climber. And he went, you're Mark Wood. And I went, how do you know? Because I had my mask on. He went, you've got Skype all over you. So that was how it was getting out, that I was using Skype, developing classrooms in the, de in the death zone as a good example. So 7,500 metres up, oxygen levels at 30%. The climbers, as you've seen on TV, are struggling to get through. And I'm sat on a piece of ice, uh, tied to the ice, so I wouldn't slip off the lotsy face. Um, and linked to a school in Australia, um, 200 kids in Australia, sat in a sports hall watching me on a, a big screen, uh, live on in the death zone on Mount Everest, mm -hmm. right? But there is an issue, there is a problem here, and it's getting back to what we've talked about. 
So I'm t- talking to 10,000 kids worldwide. Some of them are privileged, some of them aren't. Um, they all live in different areas of the planet. I've got about five to ten minutes in a very volatile area to speak to these kids about something and try and get them to think of something. So what I did, I came up with four things, and this is what I stick by now. These are my four things that I talk to kids about in schools and adults. It will resonate with everybody, and it's in order. So I think the most important things in life are this. So the first thing is having a respect for yourself. And this is what triggered me to tell this story yeah. because the, the, the J- Jordan, is it? Jordan Peterson. Yeah, yeah, he says that everything comes from yourself, your own space. And I believe that. Everything comes from here. The center of the universe is wherever you're standing at that given mm-hmm. time. So I think having a respect for yourself, no matter what you look like, who you are, where you're from, is the most important thing because that's the energy that you will exert out and the respect you exert exert out. The second thing is have an equal respect for the environment. Re-engage with what's important. From picking litter up, (laughs) just picking, you know, why is it there? It's not yours, doesn't matter. Pick it up. To actually understanding the flow of how uh, nature keeps human beings alive um i encourage schools to make acts within the school you know maybe make plastics or whatever and you can make changes very very easily within places um and it might not be the thing that changes the whole you know climate action mm-hmm. thing globally but it inspires the next person next to you and it makes you feel good and it's all quite a powerful tool the third thing is um from coventry um, not many polar explorers from Coventry. So I think differently about life. I look at life as a maybe a movie. I'm central part of the movie and I want great people to be part of that movie. So I encourage people to be part of what I do. Um, and, you know, just to have, again, it, it doesn't matter if you're from Eton or you're from wherever. You know, you can look at your own space, your own life. If you've got not much in life, you've just got a room, four walls and a, a bed, you can try and make the best of it and try and be that good person, number one, number two, and then number three. And then number four is one that I struggle with. The final one is because I am uh, a solo explorer, I'm an entrepreneur, if you like, or whatever. Um, and I, you've got to find time to have fun. And the mili- I work with a lot of military guys now who are coming to the age where they're retiring. So they're all my age and they're looking for stuff to do. So I've linked up with a lot of them. And within the military that I was in as well and fire and rescue I was in, there's a humour that sort of lays there, you know. Um, and I think you've got to find humour in what you're doing. And that's probably why I started off with a joke. <laughs> you know, it kind of relaxes in there. It's a British thing to do, blah, blah, blah. So just having a respect for yourself, respect for the environment, think differently about life and just and just try and enjoy your path, if you like. Is it not an argument that all of the events that you've done and the expeditions can be under the category of fun? As, as torturous and as challenging as I'm they may be. I'm glad you said torturous and challenging because <laughs> fun, fun is... Um, you've got to find comfort within pain. You know, you've got to find the... That's experience of finding when it's going to be why you're there. Because, for example, I'm going out on an expedition in March and I know when I step off that plane on my own for like 100 days alone, I know the first week or, well, the first hour is going to be like looking at the plane disappearing, thinking, come back. What are you doing? Um, so I'm doing, I'm, I'm crossing the Arctic over 100 days alone. Um, yeah, it was part of a, a, an ongoing film that we, well, it's the last part of a documentary that we've done for six years now. Okay, so so uh, we can talk about that uh, like, definitely. You know. uh, for, well, let, let let me can I just read out a few of the things you've done? I think it's important that yeah. the people listening kind of know. Hundred meters, what a crazy fucking person medal. I'm sat in front of. 20 meters swimming. Medal. Well, I've got. Uh, <laughs> I must have missed that one. I've got cycled three and a half thousand miles across America. Yeah. Cycled from the north to the south point of New Zealand. Walked 350 miles on foot across Iceland. I love Iceland. Mm-hmm. Cycled 800 miles north to south of Oman. 
uh, Everest, uh, North Pole, that was solo and expedition, and you've done a 700 mile walk solo to the South Pole, and you were the eighth person in history to do that solo. That's correct, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and also, just the small one of being a guide for Jeremy Clarkson, Race to the Pole. Uh, you've done over 35 expeditions. Uh, I was actually unaware of this new one that you're doing, which, mm. um, yeah, yeah. Um, well, the South Pole one was 50 days, I believe, or that was the target on your own. This one's now 100. So, uh, you know, uh, how old did you say you were? What, uh, 56. 56. I thought you said that, but I didn't yeah. want to get it wrong and piss Sorry. you off. Um, what on earth is now spurring you on to do 100 days on your own, knowing what's in front of you after everything you've already achieved? What What's left for you? I think um, whenever you set a challenge up like this, no matter how much you say, and it is it is a science-led expedition, but no matter how much you say there's science involved, there's, this, there's a documentary involved, at the core of it, you've got to be inspired yourself because it's freaking tough. It's really horribly mentally, physically tough for the majority of the time, not all the time, okay? I know explorers come on, they go, and then this happened and the wind blew and it was horrible. But there are nice times, you know. Yeah, so. we don't want to hear about any of them. Yeah. Um, so it's in 2003, I did my first expedition in the Arctic. And in 2023, 20 years later, this is tw a 20 year career. Now, you know, I'm proud of a lot of things in there, like, you know, linking, taking, um, I link, I used to go to Finham Park School and I, my first expedition, I linked to 18 kids from the Northwest Passage. And then in Everest in 2019, I linked to 1.2 mm. million kids worldwide. Oh, I saw that. So Amazing. it's kind of like that. They're the things that tick boxes. What you just read out, I'm really proud of. I'm not, I'm not hiding that. You've got to be proud of what you've done. Um, so, and also keeping this together. I think, I think another thing is keeping my ethics in place all the way through. I haven't been influenced. The only, the only one I'm not proud of is the Jeremy Clarkson one. I did it because I was a guide. I was I was working in that region of the Canadian High Arctic for six years, so they wanted me as a guide or as a. Um, there was three of us supporting him, um, and it was it was okay. I really liked working with the film crew. The the um, presenters were okay, um, and you know we can talk about that if you like, but. It's, they were pet truck diesel heads and it really didn't fall into who I am now or what I was either side of that. Okay. Um, so it, your question was about the next expedition. It's 20 years of building up experience on ice, why I wanted to do this um, and bringing it all together. And I think about eight years ago, I thought, I want to start doing documentaries. How do I do that? And it's kind of, that's how I do things. You stand in a field alone and you go, I want to do documentaries. And you scratch your head and you go, how am I going to do that? <laughs> and then you start, I think it's, you know, you must have interviewed people about putting things into the, you know, you know, your psyche and all that sort of stuff. So I started thinking, how can I get a film crew? How can I get? And suddenly I start meeting people. You know, I had thought about this the other day because I'm working with some really cool people at the mm. moment. And I, and I look at, I, I was in London on Monday and I looked at them. I thought, how do I know these people? You know what I mean? Well, so, I, well the same thing is happening now. I'm like, how the, how the fuck am I in front of someone who's the eighth person in history to walk 700 miles? It happens, you're right. It does. And you, you, you wake up and you go, yeah, well, actually, how the fuck? How the fuck yeah. did I get Mark Wood on the podcast? How's that? Uh, yeah. But do you know what I mean? Just whoever's yeah. in front of me, I'm like, how how did how yeah. did that happen? Yeah, it's great. I love it. It's mm. so exciting. Well, it you built me. something up here when we were in a. Is this being filmed as well? It's being filmed. Yeah. yeah. So we're in a great cool studio, and it's you cool built up. something. Up. But you don't like this, do you? When people say, "Oh, well done, mate." No, you, I don't. You see, no. so it's just it's just the way we sit. We we we've created our lives around our passion. Um, and I think are you from Coventry I'm a Coventry boy yeah yeah so I think there might be something about Coventrians that go yeah yeah whatever but they're not supposed to be explorers <laughs> we just no weren't. I mean just about achievement that's You're... what I mean though but we weren't we didn't know ex we weren't supposed to be explorers we were supposed to work in factories yeah, yeah. it was what we were yeah tour it, that was my upbringing it was it was important to get a job mm. and to pay the bills apart from that that was for other people mm. that weren't for us 
I, I think the world has changed a lot in the last 10 years that we can be more if you look out there there's people working out there and they're running their own businesses mm. you know from a cafe you know it's um yeah but it's, that's why i think the appeal for you is there for me because at the core of it is still a, a savage work rate of no frills there's a quote here and i'll read it because i absolutely love it you put i feel comfortable operating in a freezer I enjoy the simplicity and isolation that polar regions offer. Mm. And that word, simplicity, mm. I sometimes think we can overcomplicate life. Mm. So I did um, the Brecon Beacons on Saturday. It was half marathon. You got 55 pounds on your back. Your job is to, to do 13 miles in five and a half hours. Mm. I'm like, for once, I know what my purpose is today. I haven't got to worry about bills or stresses no, or, right. or the yeah. women in my life. I've got to worry about getting there and getting back in five and a half hours. Mm. It was painful, sprained my ankle a little bit, but fuck me, I was happy. Mm. I loved it, man. I well, loved it. it no it, phone. It was beautiful. No, it's right. And you think I've got a hundred days pulling two sledges with all my food, all my equipment in there. Um, I got the sat phones, but and I'd be doing podcasts at night. Um, so you can, you know, people can listen into somebody else. No by way. The way. How would you get any form um, of reception out there? Just through satellite phones. Wow. Um, using the, the satellite reach is pretty good. Yeah. It's probably good, better than this. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Were you but, born an explorer then, Mike? Or did you make yourself one? I think I made myself one. I had a, I think, I think I've always thought differently about life. Yeah. But, um, I spoke, it's, it's lovely this, that you're, you've timed it really well. Because the other day I spoke to my old art teacher on the phone, um, and I still called her Mrs. Riley. Of course, you do. Because <laughs> of my friend, it's his, it's his mom, and she says, "Oh, she wants to have a chat with you." And I said, "Mate, I've known her for like obviously school teacher." And I went, "What's her? What's her first name?" I couldn't remember her first name. Teachers will never so, yeah. have a first name. And when I when I was on the phone to her, it was quite. I'd love her to listen to this because I never said this to her, but she was really influential to me. She knows that anyway, because I've written it in the book that I loved going to her class. And she was, you know, this is far away from exploration. This is mm -hmm. art, you know. But um, she was one of those teachers that you just felt that she understood me, you know. Um, and when I spoke to her on the phone, her voice, even though we've all got older, her voice hasn't changed. And I felt like that like eight year old kid again and she was talking mm -hmm. to me and I was, it was just lovely. Um, but my, my first love is art. Um, and I just love that creativity and, um, and I don't know, maybe like thinking differently, etc. So I, I love art and um, I think, I don't know where that's, going it's very different from expiration but you talked about simplicity i don't yeah, know where it's going the expression that. surely isn't it of of what you want to experience so again it always you know i sat there pondering i was like well what makes somebody want to explore the world are you are you wanting to see the world or are you wanting to find out what's it within you that's good i uh, i think that i think it's it could be a bit of both i'm I I think that I'm. I think I want to expand the the education programs that I've done. I like being really creative in in the way that you you've got exploration, but how do you use that subject, mm. and how do you inspire people each, through each expedition? Um, it's like writing a book, the next book, the next book, etc. Um, and how do you take an, a, 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 any product? And you see this on or me, social media platforms how they take a, a cup and make you want to buy it because you think that's an awesome cup mm -hmm. you know how do you take exploration and really inspire people in this modern era you know shackleton and that were inspiring you know hundreds and thousands of people T ticker tape parades through through london after his expeditions we don't get in it that anymore by the way i when i got back from my north and south pole expedition um so i did the south pole the eighth person as you mentioned but then i went and did the north pole straight afterwards Okay, so no one had really done that. And when I got back, I was in uh, the bus station in Coventry with my two sledges and a beard and um, my kit. And um, I was sat down waiting for a lift. My friend to come and put, give me a lift back to my house. And people were just walking around me, you know, walking and then sort of mm. stepping over the road around me. 
Whereas like a hundred years ago, Shackleton was in his in his car in a car being taken through the streets of London with sure. <laughs> well, it's it's such a rare thing now that it, yeah, you're right. It probably it signifies something different now. Well, the, the I kind of th- like that. Though. Yeah, for sure. I liked it. What I'm guessing is across these hundred days, I'm guessing the scenery, ninety nine percent of it will be the same. You'll see the same thing every day, right? Um, yeah, more more or less, it will be the same. Yeah, yeah. So it's not. So we can rule that out as being part of the reason that someone would do no, something. No, well, well, one of the things I like to capture, and we're going to do this through the documentary, um, is the enormity of the area that I'm travelling mm. through. So you're talking, I mean, the Northern Territories of, of Canada are, are just incredible. I mean, they're just, the, the route I'm doing is two and a half thousand miles long. So... It's just vast, vast area of, of just ice. Now, they've got maps of these areas, but really, and they're pretty good, but because of the snow formation around there, they're not as detailed as they should be. Um, and there's a high population of polar bears. I was just going to ask you about polar bears. Well, well, the An interesting fact, I think, is that in 2003, there was... Uh, around 10,000 polar bears known around the Canadian area and also Svalbard a little bit further. Yeah. Um, and now, 20 years later, there's over 25,000 polar bears. So it's increased. So that's against, hang on a minute, you know, it makes you think, I thought they were disappearing. Well, they've increased because they've controlled the hunting side of it. Um, we were up there this year um, and they've, there was some Texan hunters, but they couldn't take the skins back into the States now, which is a great thing. Okay. So it's really reduced that. I work with Inuit hunters, and I'll probably say some things that won't be good for people listening to this at the moment, but you've got to understand the culture of it. So I went out with this guy called Devon, who's a remarkable young 21-year-old uh, Inuit hunter. Um, keeping His life was a little bit wayward a few years you know, when he was younger, but his mom bought him a, a, a dog and then he's now got a, over about 20 or 30 dogs and he runs the dogs and he's he's getting his the old cultural ways of the Inuit peop, uh, Inuit hunters and he's developing that and he's a he's a true inspiration um, and I worked with him and he said to me on the run that we did and this is earlier last year sorry he said um, I, if I see a bear I'm going to kill it and I went oh what, on this trip don't don't do it on this trip and he got a bit upset with us and then I had a chat with him and he he was right because to to uh it, it's killing an animal for use of the meat and the skin within their own community um and it's proper hunting it's 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 like going back to a reason for hunting rather than sport I think that's the word sport yeah, hunting yeah, yeah. Um, so to feed his dogs on just a bag of food is costing something like you know four hundred dollars a day or something stupid like that or or a week or whatever. But to kill one bear, it would feed the dogs for a whole month. So that's straight away, you know. So we saw we saw all of that. Um, but with the bears itself, um, just getting back to the population of them, the the ice on the Arctic o- Ocean is depleting. So the bears. Uh, moving back to the mainlands um, and on the mainlands you think well they'll survive they'll adapt well they need a high protein of, of uh, seal to survive so they're actually gonna the numbers are going to reduce due to climate uh, change okay um, so yeah that's that is an issue and also humans live south so there's an inter interaction with that which also cause problems so well. you train them to deal with with bear attacks and yeah, I mean, yes. Yeah. So um, it, the areas that I'll be walking, uh, skiing through in March, and I've, you know, I've done about 14 major expeditions up there. Um, I've seen bears. We saw a bear last year. Um, and they just, they're just inquisitive animals. So they, they haven't seen humans before with the re- in the regions that I walk through. Um, so they come across suddenly a red jacket and a green tent and, and you know, and there's different smells, etc. So they're just sniffing the air and all this sort of stuff and then um and you can take your photographs at a distance and then you have to scare them away and you do that i carry a shotgun and i've i fired a shotgun above a bear 
once and it was like like that like the and it sounded like the cracking of the ice so it didn't really react so you're told to generally fire around the base of the bear so the snow goes up on it but the most effective way is just to be obnoxious with loud noises mm. so you can bang ski sticks together or pots of pans or shout or whatever in, if you're in a team um but then you, you've got pen flares and, and pistol flares that you can fire in the air or fire uh, at the base of the bear um and it's like a firework going off and the bear just doesn't want anything to do with it if you let it if you allow it just to be inquisitive then the Inuit would laugh at this so if Devon ever hears this, he'll be laughing his head off. Uh, bless you, Devon. I, I love you to bits, mate. Uh, he will hear it as well. Um, so, um, oh, what was going to say? So, uh, yeah, they're just inquisitive. What was the, what was the saying? If you let them get too inquisitive. Oh, yeah, then they will <clears throat> probably just eat your food first and trash your equipment and then think about you afterwards because you're a moving right. object. Yeah. Um, and I can hear Devon laughing three, four thousand miles away now. But um, it's it, yeah, it's it, it's a lower danger within the polar region. So you've got cold, isolation, open water, kit failure, um, body failure, polar bears. You know, are there other, any other animal dangers for you to face, or is polar bears the the one that you just need to be aware of? Lemmings with flick, flick knives. <laughs> I saw a lemming on the Top Gear thing. A lemming ran into the tent, and it was a, a lemming. A lemming, yeah. yeah I'm being serious. So like a little rodent really? ran into the okay. tent, and he was like, "What's going on here?" Because he hadn't seen humans before either, and um, yeah, he just hung around the tent for a little while and then ran off into the wilderness. So you've got it in that. Can you repeat that order again for me? So you've got the cold. Um, well, I'd, I'd your say, obstacle. yeah, I'd say that the. Um, the cold, open water, like fragile ice, so okay. you know, falling yeah. through the ice. And what temperature are we talking here, Matt? That you're gonna, what's the worst that you could encounter? Well, the worst temperature I've been in is minus forty nine, which is pretty, pretty cold. Um, and so you're looking at once you get going, the average temperature is going to be around about minus twenty five, which is warm, to minus thirty five, something okay. like that. And at night, that will drop even it'll drop to about minus thirty five, forty. But you you want it to be cold because as you're moving along, you're pulling these heavy sledges um, and you're generating heat on your, on your body. Um, and what you don't want to do is sweat. Right. Because when you sweat, it's okay when you're moving, um, but when you stop, you're then stopping in minus 30, minus 40. Um, and then that sweat will turn to ice and it can get around your heart and your lungs and you can get hypothermia. Okay. So the idea of... Of really the the idea is to to get a slow pace a plug they call a polar plod the slow pace where you're not sweating too much you just get this comfortable almost a stupid comparison is Usain Bolt all right that's weird isn't it when Usain Bolt comes out the blocks and then you see this sweet moment where he's just he's just flying yeah you know, in the polar regions, I don't know whether this is going to work, this comparison, <laughs> but the polar regions, you're, you're, it's hectic to begin with on the start of the trip because you're pulling heavy weights and you're in condition to the environment. You haven't got your routine or anything like that. But then you get to an area of the expedition where you're a lot fitter and you can feel the equipment in your, in your, in your rucksack as you do when you go running. You know what's in there. It's all tight. It's all mm. working well with your body. And then you get that sweet spot of just like, just going along and then your brain starts to open up and you start thinking then and it's very cathartic and, you know, sort of monk-like, if you like, that you sort of can, sp you can think openly and, and that. So you've got that sweet area of the expedition. In terms of conditioning then, <laughs> what kind of training do you do for it? And is it best to go in carrying an extra couple of stone of body fat yeah. so that you've got your, your fuel reserves or do you go in as fit and as lean and as healthy as you can be there's two camps there really there's there's the camp which is the fit and lean as healthy as you can be um and um in my experience being putting 
being healthy anyway is is good so to sure. be healthy generally during, during the year don't be fat and ready for the expedition all year round that's just an excuse to eat <laughs> right so just be healthy generally and then how so how i prepare for this one is i'll then build up muscle um muscle uh, working muscle in my legs my back and shoulders and things like everything that's going to pack horse this these sledges along and then closer to the expedition i'll then stop training for two reasons one is to not get any injuries because mm. we just raised loads of money to do this and there's a documentary and blah 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 so to actually twist an ankle at the end is yep. stupid and then just to put a little bit of fat on around your waist on your body because when you get out there it's not really the warm it's just uh, what in my experience again it's up for grabs this but on the south pole i had weight on me and um it just kind of worked for the food i had a really light light sledge with the amount and i carried everything myself so it the calculation of the amount of food and calories you were taking to my own body mass and how that would drain over the next first week or so it kind of worked for me Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Do you have a calculation then of like how many calories you think you're going to be burning? Is it as scientific as that versus I'm going to so replace what I lose or do you just take a load of food? No, I work off the back of um, Dr. Mike Stroud who worked with Rand Fines on his um, Transantarctic expedition. Um, I think it was in 92, that's a guess. Um, and a uh, great book, Mind, um, Mind Over Matter is worth reading cool um and that it's it's good because it shows a relationship of two people on ice as well which was really toxic um but they're good friends okay now. <laughs> um so it, mike um is really well known for for doing great tests on ice and he worked out one day that ran had burnt something like eleven thousand plus calories in one day so they aver his, from his book, it's average six to 8,000 calories a day. So if you look at Olympic, you know, Steve Redgrave maybe, yeah. you know, six to 8,000 calories a day, that's what they're doing, these Olympic athletes. So that's what you acquire. Wow. So that's what I'm basing this off. Now, in my, if we're focusing on this next expedition, 100 days, the 100 days is the unknown. So involuntary people have survived up to 70 plus days but um not the the 30 days is the unknown and i think that's exciting for quite a few reasons one is the nutrition side and i'm working with a, a great uh, nutritionist called ellen um a, a young uh, a woman from what coventry university but i think she's left now she's I got a PhD in that. So she's been working with me on how we can actually build on the calories um, and keep the, the weight down and the volume down. And that's the key thing. Yeah, because that's a lot of food. You could easily it? put 20 bur burgers. Yeah. But it's, you'd think I've got to have a breakfast, uh, evening meal, and a pudding in these packets, and then salami, cheese, fat you know um, protein bars blah 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 and if you just go up the road and get a bag of you know normal bag of shopping yeah that's a whole day's worth of food sure um and it can't be it can't be like mars bars in my book it can't be mars bars and things like that because it's a quick kick of sugar and then a real downer so it's got to be prolonged thought out fuel mm. for this endurance okay so um what what my first thing is that I need the calories, but I need to keep it nice and light and reduce the weight. So one of the things I do, and I'm, it's, there's no like smokes and mirrors here. I I'm really open with this because I, I want people to learn from what I do. Um, is I just get a lightweight uh, um, bag. You know these bags that you can um, you get fruit at and at a, you know in a supermarket. Yeah. Really lightweight yeah, yeah. things. I'm giving a load of these. Um, and I put, I empty the packet of the food like a curry into there, and then I put salt and cheese and fat and blah blah blah, blah and salami in there. And then you calculate that it's not just a thousand calories; it's you know fifteen hundred calories in there, if you like. And then I sort of twist it around, and, and you've got this like a bulk of a of a food packet. And then 
and I was speaking to Expedition Foods, who are the guys who make this stuff, the other day, and, and I was telling them this, and they laughed, right? Because I, I then take the, the, the breakfast, which is porridge and raisins, which is um, 800 calories, um, and I then mix it with the apple and custard, um, I heard this in a so, previous interview. Yeah, <laughs> sounded lovely. Yeah, I think in the in the film that I did um, in the tent, I say apple and custard, and you can taste the meat from the night before. Yeah. So you got this meat custard porridge effect, which is look. I mean, it's fuel. You know, sounds so it's good great. to me. Yeah, you know, I'd eat that in normal life. So. Yeah. But it, then you got two packets, and I'm sort of demonstrating it. You know, two packets together, um, full of salt and everything in there. So everything has been reduced to this, like, you know, uh, an eighth of what that bag was. Yeah. And that's how you can then put it into your sledge and. Sure. And you'll have. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So we're looking at getting as many calories into as little packaging as possible. Yeah, and as right? light as possible. And as light but as possible. But affect it with with a crunch as well. <clears throat> yeah. Because you can you can add powder and put a tablet in there if you like, but you know you need you're away for a hundred days. You want something to look forward to at night. Yeah. You want a nice bit of food what know? happens if you run out of food if it takes you, you 105 won't. days you, you won't. won't run out of food no because you will you're constantly calculating your distance etc and this is another controversial thing right and anybody does expeditions will go ah, he's an idiot for saying that but this is what i found right um people usually take uh an extra four or five days worth of food as a contingency just yeah, in case just something in case. goes wrong sure that's quite a good thing to do that isn't it however <laughs> if you think about it 100 days right you're doing 100 days and during that those 100 days a storm happens which it will and three days you sat in a tent right you you're not moving so you reduce the amount of calories that you're having you only have half rations or whatever and as you're going along if you're running out you won't run out of food because you constantly, you've got that supply for the 100 days. You're allocating it. Out. You're allocating yeah. it. So if it comes round to, it, it, you just can't run out of food. But what you can also do is in that storm, you can't have a, like, a, like we would do at home where you have a binge day and go, fuck well, it. Well, you, you won't want a binge day because your, bo your body develops differently. So you're, you're kind of, you won't have a, <clears throat> it's not, when you, when you walk all day, you generate the hunger. So you eat, but when you don't, on it, I found on expedition when you don't and you're in a tent, you just sleep and rest. So your hunger isn't there. That's just me. It might be different for everybody else. So, and and that five days worth of food is is weight. Yeah, you know. So what's what? I might regret that by the way. <laughs> yeah, if it you starved like, to death. Yeah, it was only, if you only <laughs> had five more days of food. <laughs> let's, let's hope that doesn't happen. So what? What is? What's now? What, I still, I'm still trying to get to the like underlying motivation for you to do yet another ridiculously tough challenge. Like with everything that you've conquered, 56 years of age. Like is this just because it's who you are, and you will always push yourself, and you will always see what you're made of, or, or do, you, or are you doing it for? Purely to inspire other people to get off their ass and see the world. I think. I think, as I said before, it's got the inspiration has got to be personal to start off with, because it's tough. So I, I think it's a, as I say, it's a combination of all the expeditions I've done, the experience, the filming, etc., coming together in this this one expedition. I could have called it. It's called Solo One Hundred. Yeah. I could have called it Solo Seventy Five or Seventy Six, which which is tops the the. It's a Guinness World Record attempt, which I don't like. It's only purely through the fact of what it, the nature it is that Guinness World Rock Records yeah. said, "Isn't that you know a Guinness World?" I was like, "Yeah, probably." And we did. They did the research on it. So, and I, the longest journey was I think seventy three days or something, um, and that was because it was a survival thing. They were looking for people, okay, um, and it wasn't like some idiot getting off a plane going. But I, I set it as 100 to begin with because initially I wanted to um, have 100 films from kids around the world um, talking about climate action and their 
area so somebody in africa saying this is our village and this is what we're doing for climate action someone in new york city saying the same thing so i was going to like a calendar i was going to every day of the expedition i'll say and this is john from sweden he's going to talk about he's nine years old he's going to about this so that was the idea but it was so complicated to get that together it's a lovely concept and if anybody wants to steal it just crack on but it was very difficult 100 voices 100 days that was the whole concept um so i dropped that we carried on with the documentary and then we created the i linked up with some great climate scientists and it developed into that however the podcast will still link to kids and sure. everybody else but the hundred was there mm. then on the badges that we've made yeah okay. so then i was like oh okay so i'm still doing the hundred days <laughs> do you expect this to be your toughest challenge I know it's the longest period of time. Oh yeah, for, for sure, yeah. Because that South Pole one sounded uh, pretty pretty gruesome, and I love I love you mentioned the fact that at one point you weren't alone on that journey when you had this arm around you, and because you you reinforce that you know you're not really a religious man, right? Like most people now, you, after expeditions, I'm more spiritual of sure of stuff, but. Yeah, in my own way. Yeah, is that the toughest one you've done? So let, let, let's let assume that the Solo 100 is going to push you where you haven't been before. Is the the 700 mile walk to the South Pole the hardest challenge you faced? It's it's, it's one that I'm really proud of because um, nobody thought I could do it and I didn't think I'd do it. And I again, I'm an ordinary person. People who've done it before me were all special forces or Norwegian skiers or whatever, you know, and then there was this guy from Coventry trying to wing it, you know what I mean? <laughs> so that's what I was proud of. I wore a Cov t uh, football Did top you? at the South Pole and that was the year that Strachan took, took them down. Oh, no. So actually being on the South was quite, you know, apt. <laughs> that was the last season, I, that was the last year I had a season ticket when we got oh, really? relegated. Yeah, I used to love it, I yeah. used to love it, but it used to ruin my weekends. I'd no. go home after watching them and I'd be distraught. Listen, keep the podcast light because we don't want to I know, depressed. yeah, <laughs> it was like things are turning around for us now but um yeah so th that was the one that really interested me because like i say it, w it had been done by so few people it sounded like you had some pretty dark times there you were on your own yeah and it was just a fascinating well i lost my ipod as well i know on day one on a day four or five or yeah. something of a 50 day journey so i only had sort of sky and ice to look at and I felt like I couldn't really, on days something like six or seven, I was counting 3,000 ski steps in my head. I thought, oh, I can't do this. Um, and I kind of closed my eyes and I thought, where do I want to be at the mo this moment in time where we're on the planet? I've got two beautiful dogs. I'm surprised I haven't mentioned them already. Um, but they're great dogs. And um, I named my sledges Poppy and Kira so I don't kick my sledges. Right. Um, but anyway, so I was there closing my eyes and I thought, right, there's a place I go to in Wales next to sea um, along the beaches there. I train along there with tyres and they've got pine forests and things like that um, in Norfolk. And I started to walk my dogs, started to see them running around and um, on the beach. I could smell the sea, I could smell the pine. And after about two or three hours of this dreamscape and me skiing, I covered about six nautical miles. And that's how I kind of did most of the expedition through taking my brain somewhere else. The, the key to isolation is routine mm. to begin with. Finding a routine in your house, wherever you are, in a cell, in a community, on ice. And then second thing is having a focus. Um, you, the brain is an incredible tool. You can really sort of, it's powerful. You can make yourself strong, positive in, my, in seconds. Um, and you can drift away from to different areas of the planet, meet people from the past, um, be so so creative. Another way of saying this, I love saying this to people, is I'm looking out of a window here, and there's twenty or thirty people. There's a lot going on. There's trees the other side of the window. When you wake up in the morning, the noises start happening, and all these colours come in, and the brain starts functioning, and Without you knowing, your brain is taking a lot, your, your senses are alive. Now you go on to the center of the Arctic with 360 of nothing, and you haven't got any of that. You haven't got color as we see it. Um, you've got silence, deafening, silence. And with that, if you can get your head around it and 
live through it it's extremely um it's really cre creative you can be really creative in your mind and that's where i get my ideas for things that we won't talk about today and a million things i'm doing around expiration you know really creative things that i'm doing around expiration we can talk about afterwards if you like or another mm -hmm. podcast um and that, that's where you you know you go up on the mountains or the run that you did at the weekend there'll be part of that run where you're locked in your brain thinking about other things and your body's still moving these are wonderful tools that we have and we need to lock into sometimes you know people ha don't know that how to experience this it's very easy anybody who's got a dog who takes them a walk understands it so it's it's just a way of drifting away for a while and understanding it's like a ah uh, it's a religion in itself it's like being in church you know you kind of get that sp i've got a church opposite me and i go in there quite a lot because it's quiet there's no one in there i take my dogs and i just sit there for a while not not because i'm fully sort of religious it's just that i'm just having a bit of peace of peace of mind you know what i mean so, yeah, and I think what you do nice coffee in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think what you've just described is uh, for some people that will be their worst nightmare, you know, no distractions, no noise, no phone, no laptop. And for oh, others, yeah. it will sound yeah, you're right. re energizing. Yeah. And, uh, and for me, it's, it's both a combination of scary uh, and exciting. I always find um, so after this event that I did at the weekend, when I came back, I was in such a good position to make better decisions mm. it was a bit like a detox it mm. was it was a physical detox i kind of needed to get some stress out um i'm always encouraged by some of the guys that i speak to the best psychotherapists they say you know never make big decisions in your life when you feel shit you know mm. do something like get outside go for a run have a coffee with a friend do something that puts you in a bit of headspace mm. and then make decisions and it kind of sounds like it's almost the journeys that you do what you put your body through allows you to to be in a, a headspace that is your creative best, your most thoughtful best, your reflective best. And it's just interesting to me how everyone reaches that point of their best and how everyone strives for something different. But I do think there's a good argument that, uh, if, you know, if we're talking mental health for, for men especially, and we'll, we'll, we'll say mental health for everybody, um, I, I find it near impossible to feel depressed or down when I'm doing something active like the things we're talking about. It, depression just doesn't exist in that moment. No. No, you're right. It's um, people say being active is difficult to get into if you're not active. It's difficult when you're in a rut, when you're in a in a hard mental state. Um, and I've been there. You've mm. been there. Yeah. Um, and the guys that I work with who work in really, I mean, I was a soldier. I was a firefighter. I'm an explorer. You know, the big I am. It's not. I've been depressed. I've cried. I've, I've had hard times. You know, and when you're in that rut, it's very difficult to get out. And what's sometimes, even when I listen to podcasts or I listen to people like us, it, I'm always telling them to oh, shut the flip up. You know what I mean? Because being depressed is a certain level. It's a real weight on your head. And no matter what people say, sometimes you just can't get out of it. It's really, does that make sense? It does. It's what? the honesty behind that. We can all sit yes. there and go, yeah, you're right. I should do that. I should go. I will go for a walk tomorrow. Well, the reality of that for majority of people, men and women, is it's freaking tough. If you're really in a rut and you can't see the way out and you, you've got money problems or whatever it is, my advice <laughs> is how I reach the North Pole or Everest is, and it's such a simple, is just that I take one step. And that's the progress. Mm. And then I take another step, and that's the progress. You can't do this straight away. You can't just get outside and put a tracksuit on and start running. You've just got to open a window, and just smell the fresh air, and then, do you know what I mean? What's the what's the most what's the biggest challenge you've had outside of the world of expeditions? Myself, maybe just to just to keep my you know I work alone a lot. And I sat at home last night, and we're being honest here, and I felt lonely at home. I had my dogs there, but I felt lonely. I thought, Jesus, this is, I need to go and meet some people. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like it, it, it is yourself. And I think even if you're in a, a father 
and you have a, a wife and four or five kids, you can still be alone. You can be alone in Oxford Street. You know, it's it's just about me making sure that I get through life as hap with my four with my four um, things that I mentioned it earlier, with the respect for myself and thinking differently and all that and having fun. It's about just me trying to get the most out of this wonderful opportunity that I've been given from my parents. Does that make sense? It I don't want to get too sort of wild with that, but... You get as wild as you want on this yeah, podcast. But you, the reason I'm saying all this is not therapy for myself. It's just that there might be just one person who's sitting in a chair at home who's maybe the same age as me, who got, who's sitting there going, oh, I'm listening to an explorer here, but he's had a great life, I bet he's done all that. You know, here I am stuck at home and I've got all these money worries. That's the person I'm speaking to. It, it's, it's not about exploration, it's about just saying, don't, I hate swearing, but don't flip and give up. You, you've just got to really, you just got to go, right, breathe, open that window, get some fresh air in, you know, take a look in the mirror, have a little bit of a wash, you know, get yourself sorted, put a fresh T-shirt on, go and sit outside with a nice lov lovely coffee or whatever drink you want, step away from the alcohol, have a cup of tea, have a cup of coffee, and then um, and then, then that's it. And then the next day, maybe just walk to the end of the garden. Do you know what I mean? That is, yeah, I think the, the danger is that people will see the distance that you've covered in exploration but exploration can take part a mile down your street you know there's things to mm. see all around us so or I think, in your head yeah yeah i still believe that getting outside of your head and actually physically doing it would mm. be but you're right i think everything Some starts bit, there i meant disability I get in that, yeah yeah really. oh for sure okay yeah, yeah. but but you're right though even, um, even the expeditions you've done will have started in your head they have to you can't you yeah. can't create something that hasn't started in your head so there is that skill set but I think when you, if we're talking like middle-aged guys, there is an argument that I think they can be a little bit more adventurous because I think the 40-year-old, the 50-year-old probably has a little bit more of a reality check knowing that they're not going to be here <laughs> yeah. forever. So but, there is a bit of a fuck it time where you go, you know what, I've got nothing to lose now. I'm, you know, if you've been unhappy, for example, for 40 or 50 years, because I kind of like, you know, I've messed up my 20s quite badly. I'm 38, not married, no kids. Part of me now is like, do you know what? Alex, fuck it. If, if you're going to explore and do something, like now is your chance. Hmm. And I think there, there's a there's a benefit to things not panning out how you thought they would in life because it opens new windows. Yeah. The worst thing you can do is not open your front door and walk out. You know, that's the worst thing you can do is just stay in. And even if, you know, great ideas or being adventurous, you've got to go outside your front door. Um, one thing that exploration has, has actually given to me is an appreciation of what I've got at home. So I do like coming home. I like going into my, I'm a very clean freak, a clean house and seeing my dogs there <coughs> when I come back. Um, my friend looks after them while I'm away. Uh, they don't go in kennels, they stay with. They stay in luxury friendship home. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, it's it, appreciating that, appreciating the trees where I live and where I can walk with them and having a coffee with some of the, the guys up the road and all this sort of stuff so uh, travel makes you appreciate what you've got or uh, or if you, what you've got isn't good it allows you to make changes of what you've got yeah absolutely so, the dog thing is big I, I miss cuddling my dog so much the dog the companionship that you can have with a dog is just uh, i never understood until i got a dog yeah just amazing i mean like some people haven't got dogs and they like cats or, or rabbits or whatever. but it's just that i mean i my my life is if i i've got like a hundred and odd photographs on my phone you'd think oh it's all of ice it's not it's of dogs <laughs> <laughs> you know so yeah. um no I, I hear you I've, ever since i was young and it's interesting i was speaking to someone about how to help guys who don't have a vision get a vision back because mm -hmm. sometimes life beats it out of you you know when you have dreams as a kid and, and whatever and you pursue them for a little while in your head but then yeah life happens you get a job you almost get educated that that you know the explorer lifestyle isn't for you you know it's mm. about getting a job it's about fitting in with with everyone else and they say one of the most helpful things you can do to reinstall that vision is go back to what what you used to dream about as a kid for me it was always being around dogs i was never not around dogs in my head when i was young mm. never 
they used to be obsessed with films like Turner and Hooch. Obsessed. <laughs> and that's the dog I got. Yeah. The French Mastiff. The big, oh, right. beautiful, soft as shit. Like, he looks scary, but beautiful. Mm. He only died when he was six. So, yeah, I know. But it's kind of weird. Like, you can go back to the things that you know are almost like your dreams or, or what's inside of you. And I just think sometimes we can get so far away from those in life that it's no wonder that most of us are unhappy. Mm. and depressed because there's probably loads of kids that dreamed about doing the Everest when they were young mm. now it probably doesn't even enter their world because why would they they've they've got the bills to pay they've got the boss to please you know what I mean it's like mm. it's about finding that happiness so it's number four is it it's happiness though? are you happy like when con you're being content and I'm, no this is the my point of it I struggle with number four but it's about you know it doesn't matter within a legal sense, it doesn't matter what you do in life, whether you have a, a massive family or you're alone or wherever you live in that, as long as you can find happiness within your life, then it's it's great, you know? And I struggle with that, because uh, I work so, I you know, take it as this, right? I This is the biggest expedition I'm gonna do. This is a, a six year documentary that we're bringing together. Um, this is great science behind it and um, other stuff that I haven't mentioned like Warwick University are doing brilliant engineering around it for, for the stuff that I'm doing and working with psychologists as well uh, so called Sophie and you know it's just there's a lot going on with this expedition and I'm thinking well this is going to be the last time that I pull sledges like this because I'm at a certain age um and th and after this i've got other plans again we can talk about that another time and then i went to see some of my friends who i worked in africa with one of them and then i worked in the himalayas this last year with them and one of the guys i worked on the north pole and other stuff so it was kind of like four guys getting together and all this and they went let's do the south pole in 2024 um we could do it for because they're all working in mental health now and they said you know we can build a good team around it um and uh i just went oh shit <laughs> are you doing it because i had a real spark in me going this is a great idea yeah it's not just a south pole trip that's just the platform and what we're going to do and the boys out playing you know but since then, we're developing it and developing it. I had meetings yesterday. So it's happening. It, yeah, it will happen. It will happen. And then I thought, well, I want to cross Greenland with dogs. So that's on my head now. You know, proper dogs, you know, um, huskies and that. So that's in my head as well. And I spoke to the film crew about it on Monday. And they were like, yeah, this is great. And I was like, yeah, this is this, this is great. <laughs> but isn't that how it's supposed to go? So all yeah, of the challenges that I've done lately, I'm like, okay, sign up. Oh, fucking why have I signed up? Oh, I've got to do this challenge, do it. Oh, top of the world. I'm so glad I did it. Mm. So it, it, it kind of, once you know that familiar pattern, I, I don't have as much resistance now. By the way, if there's ever opportunities to go to the South Pole, please let me know. <laughs> this is what this interview is about. <laughs> Honestly, I don't want to check my pockets. Yesterday, I was in I was in Starbucks watching all of the stuff that you've done, and it's been a long, long time since I got so fired up. I mean, you said that at the start, and I really appreciate it, and I will take it because you should take. It's what I've learned to do as well: take compliments and and stuff like that. But so that's really kind of you. Um, yeah, but the amount of people that you interview, though, it's you know you've got. Yeah, but it's touched something in me clearly. Okay. Okay. I think there's You're not the, on the team. I think there's <laughs> I think there's a few things. It's it's the it's the vision and the courage to pursue that. Mm. And then I think there's an element of like you've you've done things that so few people have done. But then when I think about the bigger picture of like what you're seeing and exploring and like if you're only on this planet for eighty years and you can touch and see things that are just so miraculous that like I say But that's great. I get that, that's great, that's awesome. But if you don't get the opportunity to go out and do exploration, it's not about Everest or South Pole, North Pole. It's about having a fulfilling life. It's about that. It's about looking at your life and making the best of what of your life. That's what I'm trying to push out to people. I'm not telling people to put skis on. I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I agree what you're saying. Yeah. Because we're like-minded in that sense. Mm. But this podcast will go out to people who don't do this sort of stuff. They, these people are real people. 
There were, you know, real people who go out and work, got families and mortgages and all yeah, this sort of stuff. I, I agree with and, that. So I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you, but I'm just saying that it's kind of, it's just about, you know, getting that sort of got fulfillment you. in life. I got you. However, I believe everyone who's physically capable, if they can climb a mountain, for example, should at least go and taste it. So yeah. in England itself, you can go and do Scarfell, right? Yeah, yeah. In the beautiful Lake District. I wonder how many men have gone and challenged themselves to do that. I think it's easy for us to say that like, you know... Does this podcast go out to predominantly men, men then? Is well, it, it's is the it better it? man, so yeah. It's, okay. But, but we have a, a female audience too. Yeah. I think, one, they're interested in what guys talk about behind yeah. closed doors. And I think they're also interested in how it relates to their partner and the people that they're with. Okay. So we're very centered around, like, one of my biggest drivers was becoming a better son. So it's not, mm. it's not about becoming a better man to take over the world so that my life's better for me and I get mm. more money. It's about, well, you know, what difference am I making to the people around me? Because mm. I've firsthand tasted that if I'm not in a good place, it's not nice for the people around me. No, you're right. Yeah, and that, that hurts them, you know. I've seen some of the damage I've done. I mean, relationships with, with women, I've been fucking horrible. Mm. So it's like, well, that's horrible for them. You've mm. hurt them, you've damaged them. So it's it's it it becomes yes you have to go in selfishly inside of you but it's so that you can positively impact everything around you. Yeah, the on the mountains I give a briefing at the start to the guys. So I run treks every year to Everest Base Camp and and a Perna Circuit and stuff. And every day people can sign up for it, and we guide that as me and this ex-military guy we guide it every year. And one of the things I say to them is the most important person on this expedition, on this trek, is me, right? <laughs> the most important person on this expedition to you is you. Right, yeah. Right? You get yeah, my yeah, sense yeah. <laughs> So it's like if I can make sure that I'm well fed and I'm fit and I can be active, I can then look after you. Yeah. And it's the oxygen thing coming it's the down on the planet. example, yeah. right? Yeah. So... It's the same, I would guess, within a family, and it's tough when you've got lovely little kids there. But if I, in my family, if you like, if I don't look after myself and I can't take my dogs for out, out for a walk, then they're going to suffer. So it's kind of like you've got to really have a respect for yourself. If it, you know, you've got the number one priority in anybody's life is your own health, um, physically and mentally. That's the number one priority. Period. That's it. I agree. Because after that, you can then work everything else out. <coughs> I said to Mike, I shared the explorers. Come to that microphone. Mark. Yeah, I, I shared the explorers cover Great Britain and Ireland, and we had a big committee meeting the other day because I said that I'm going to disappear for six months, so I changed it over to somebody else. And at the end of the thing, I said to them, um, "Be be healthy, be happy, and the rest will work itself out." And that, and that's true. It's. You know, start of this year, I was my health was deteriorating because my father passed away. Started last year, sorry, a uh, long sort of um, deterioration of um, <laughs> the irony of me trying to think what it is. What is the disease when you try and think when you lose well, your memory? Well, you got dementia. Dementia. Yeah, <laughs> the irony. Well, that's a bit worrying Ooh, about. Yeah, right. I, know, sorry. I forgot what <laughs> dementia. What's that word? Yeah, dementia? not a good time, mate. <laughs> um, so yeah, he unfortunately passed away of that, and I took on a brunt of that really, looking after him because of COVID. I was the only uh -huh. one who's going to uh, to go. So my mental health suffered, and my, and with that, my physical health suffered. And there I was building up to the biggest expedition mm. that I could ever do. So the first thing I did when he passed away was I then took myself to a health place abroad and just sorted myself out for three weeks, dropped some weight, got myself sort of focused again. I know a lot of people can't do that. I get that. Sure. But but what I'm trying is I thought, I wrote a list of what I wanted to do this year, simplistic list, realistic list. And um, number one on the list was health. And that that's what allowed me then to complete everything else on the list. Sure, because if you don't have that, you don't have anything. No. Right? The happiness thing is really interesting to me. And I, I see it, and I think you've just described it perfectly there in the fact that you had this list of things and you're almost saying that the happiness is going to come off the back of the purpose. So I believe purpose is more important than happiness. So if you go and conquer and do great things, you've got to become a certain individual to be able to go and do those things. And it's in that process, it's in that work that the fulfillment and happiness is found. Does that make sense? So if I kick back and go, I just want to be happy, but I do fuck all with my life, 
for me, that's not going to equal me happy. In the moment, it might, because I've got my pizza, I've got my beer, I've got Netflix. I'm fucking happy. Mm. Six months of that, I'm miserable as shit. Yeah, I'm missing right. out on things. I'm overweight. I've got my relationships how, aren't deep. How many millionaires are not happy? That's what you're saying, yeah. isn't it? The yeah. development, the happiness is often, I find, for a lot of men, especially, is in growth. Mm. It's in challenge. It's yeah. you proving. The happiness comes from, look at me. That's look good. at what I've got inside of me. Mm. And like you say, it's not about North or South Pole. It's just the fact that that, that lived inside of you. Yeah, that ability to go out and conquer and do something and prove to yourself. And again, that links back to your first one of respect. Mm. For me, respect, like, I know this might sound a bit harsh, but you do have to earn it. You have to earn it from others. So why wouldn't you have to earn it from yourself? Mm. You got to act in a way that's respectful. So by doing challenging things, this is kind of how I've always thought about it in my head. Because mm. I avoided all that up until I was the age of 23. Anything scary I would bottle. Anything, anything. Mm. And my life was so miserable and so so small and condensed into my little bedroom mm. just because of the the not having a purpose. Mm. So there was no happiness to be found in that life. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a great fresh perspective for me. Mm. Um, so you're absolutely you are absolutely right with that. Yeah. So the 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 idea of me doing that big challenge isn't the big challenge. It's like who what kind of man would I have to be to to do that? Mm. And, and how much pride would I feel in that? And how much dedication mm. would I have to show? How disciplined would I have to be? And I like those values. There's another There's another side of this is that <coughs> um, criticism from others can have, have an effect on people. And the more successful you are or the more challenging you are with yourself, the more people are there to... You've got a, a lot of people to go, good for you. But there's a lot of people out there waiting in the wings to sort of add their pennies worth. And they're not there on other times. They're there when you're successful or about to do something. Um, when I came back from the South Pole, I mean, I, I don't crave limelight uh, profile. You know, I have to create a profile for sponsorship and stuff, but I don't really crave it. And you said to me, I didn't know anything about this next expedition. It's enormous, but I haven't really put it out there because I haven't done it yet. You know, there's no use having a party before something that I haven't done. Yep. And that takes the pressure off me as well, even though I'm talking about it now, <laughs> um, to just get off that plane and just kind of work it out and then get back and then we'll have a glass of champagne when I get mm. back. Do you know what I mean? I'll walk my dogs first, but you know, we'll do that. But it's, that's, it's just, I've, I've learned how to it's whatever you do, you're going to get criticised for it, because there's going to be people listening who are sick of those people who are having a go, or there's always people saying stuff. That if you sorted those people out, there's people waiting in the wings to take their place. Of course, that's just the way life is. As long as it doesn't affect the business, which is a legal matter, then um, then you've just got to get them out of your lives. As in, it's dead easy with uh, social media yeah, because you can just act like God and just block them. <laughs> of course, but what will be triggering there is a bit of resentment. And I had to be careful when I was doing this study because there was a, even a part of me that was so excited to do this, a little bit of resentment crept in. Going, yeah, on what? On, 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 on everything that you've done. Oh, really? Part, yeah, because oh, it's all right for Mark. But then you do in the what work. Way? But But this is the shit that comes in your head. But all right for Mark, what what does that mean? But th this is the outside yeah, I, I perspective. Do, I do get it though. Yeah, but... so Mark's already an explorer. Mark can financially fund this. And by the way, this this isn't me thinking, this no, is no, the bullshit no. in my head yeah. for a split second. Yeah. This is why I love to speak to people like yeah, you. Yeah. You're a normal guy from, com what I'm trying to say is anyone could have done what you've done. Say that again. Anyone <laughs> <laughs> could have had a go at doing what you've done. What you've done is incredible, but it's not its not just for you, Mark. Like Other people can go and explore the world too. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. The That's world, what I mean. Yeah, yeah, okay. And there's a bit of resentment sometimes where like, well, I didn't make the most of it. So someone else has, they've gone and explored and okay. done things that I might want to do. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't. And a, a resentment can live there. And that's when you get the people that start to go on your social media and attack. Yeah. Because you're holding up a mirror to them. Yeah. I mean, how sad is that if your life is spending your time criticizing you for going out and exploring the world? Yeah. It's really, and I but mean, that's sad. what social media is now, though. It's it can be. Part yeah. of it. Yeah, you're right. It yeah, can it's be. Sad. It's not all yeah. of it. Social media is a wonderful tool for connecting, yeah. but it's also like everything that humans create, it's got a dark side to it as well. Um, and it's just how, but the good thing is, is you can, you can control that as the, as the person, you can control it. 
one thing, and it's slightly different, but one thing I've learned about social media is that one thing I've learned about myself is I know my my brand. I know what I am as a brand. I know that I don't reach 10 million people a week. I know that majority of the people who like me and like what I'm doing is probably about 60 to 200 people. And more or less, they're based around Coventry, you know, and a lot of aunties in there and stuff like that. Yeah. So I get that and I kind of like it. You know, it's like... You know, here's another picture of me doing this. Um, but the most important thing for me is is what I do and a documentary to then expand it to a wider audience. Sure. So that's I understand my brand. I understand that it doesn't. It, I'm thankful it doesn't really work on social media because I'm not too interested in it mm -hmm. in social media. But I'm also thankful that I'm got the ability to operate in these extreme areas, and then we can film the whole of that from the good to the pain um and then you can watch it yeah well i can't wait and for every person that criticizes you there'll be people watching you that are inspired too so i know the social media and i'm not a fan and yeah people will go on there and go fucking hell but people will also like myself go on there and go this is fucking awesome mm. like do you know what i mean and, and and there's those people too so with every good is, is is bad and with every dark is light so it's kind of like we i don't think we can have one without the other unfortunately no I, you know, um, if if there's people there who listen to this and, and are getting annoyed by certain things, then I mean I mean this all in a legal way, by the way. Then take it out of your life. You know, you hear you've heard this on other podcasts. Surround yourself by like-minded people who will keep who, who will keep you. You know, tell mm. you when you're doing wrong. But you know, if people are just I, I, when you say take it out of their life, what do you mean? Get rid of the thing that's harmful. Yeah, social media. It, I, I, no, even people close. It's kind right. of. Um, I've had people who have been quite toxic to my work, um, my my flow of what I want to do. What what I do. I mean, we, it's really hard what I do putting expeditions together, finding the sponsorship. You know, I have to pay a mortgage. I'm a normal guy in mm -hmm. that sense. I'm not rich. People mm -hmm. think I'm rich. I'm not rich. I'm a normal chap. You know what I mean? And um, it's 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 hard. So so there are people there going, oh, I don't know why you're doing that. And it's like, fuck. Just, you know, and you either distance yourself or you kind of go, well, I'm not really going to contact these guys mm. again. And it sounds quite harsh that it's not on everybody. But it's certain people that I've gone, you're really draining my energy here, you know. And I've kind of just gone down a different path. I don't know how controversial that is. But it's not controversial one little bit. I think, there's, I think that's the hardest thing to do, to get rid of toxic people. I think we could start with base level stuff, like what are you watching, what are you reading? This is what we call the palette. It's like if you're watching negative stuff all mm. day, news. Yes. If you are finding that you're on social media becoming a bit hateful, wasting time... Maybe you start there. But I think if a lot of people got rid of social media, I think they'd find pretty empty gaps in their life now, yeah, which is yeah. a sad state. And, uh, you know, I'm not claiming I'm better than uh, than everyone on this, but I try and real pay attention to what am I doing with my time and my energy? Because mm. it's easy to get sucked into that trap. It's really easy. And if, mm. you know, if you spend two hours a day on social media and then you get rid of it, what the fuck do you do with yourself? Mm. You've got to do something. But, you know, we, we both said that social media is good as well. You know, it is good in the sense that you can post photographs on there that kids can see in Australia, your family can see, and you, you can yeah. use it in a positive way. But there, there is that. If it's, if it's being toxic to you, and you're absolutely right, again, it's, if things are being toxic to you, then you've got to address it. Whether it's sitting there, I won't watch a film where a dog's been killed in it. Mm. You know, it's like that kind of thing. It's, you know, I'm mm. not, well, I'm not going to watch that film. You know, it's... It, yeah, it's, I get that. I watch things which are really which are nothing to do with exploration as well it's kind of like i want to watch a spy thriller or something yeah. like that you know but i think i think the first stage to that mark is you have to know that this is harmful to me yeah so you have to catch yourself wasting time and seeing what impact it has and i think that's the scariest thing i'm not sure people really know that they're even doing it or that yeah. it's harmful because it feels so normal yeah i agree do you know what i mean so the yeah. first stage is like I think it's a great question to ask yourself. It's like, well, how do I want to live my life? Mm. What, what do I want it to look like? And, you know, if you'd have asked me a few years ago, I know that I wouldn't want to spend my time on social media watching TV. I just would be devastated. And that, it was 
a lot of that regret I used to drive myself forward because I know if I was to die tomorrow, I'd look back and go, Alex, you fucking wasted so much time. Oh, that's a shame. Oh, it's really, yeah, it's painful, yeah. but I know it to be true. I'm not going to pretend it's not. Okay, you can come to the South Pole. Yeah, <laughs> all the, all the, get, I know if I got the violins out, it'd work. But do you know what I mean? Yeah, but that, I that's something mean, that would make yeah. me look back and go, you did something. Yeah. And there are things in my life that I can point at, but there's it's overridden by opportunities lost I think not having the courage to step forward um, or behaving in a way that doesn't sit well with me that kind of thing is still overriding me at 38 yeah, it's quite tough but you know what you're doing by doing this this podcast do I have to tell you that or or do you know that well I questioned it this the, morning why I'm doing it why well, in what way because I always because it you know it's costly for me okay so I have to look at it and think, you know, is it a, is it a lead generator for me? And I'm like, well, not really, because I'm not a businessman in that sense. I don't do it and look at how many leads I got through. So I'm like, well, no. Then I thought, well, one, uh, it really is an opportunity for, for me to um, sharpen my curiosity and, and work with that, because I'm very curious. Mm. But what I love doing is creating a platform for me and you to have a conversation that probably would have never existed in the world if it weren't for this podcast. So I like skipping the small talk and I like talking about what we're talking about now because mm. most men will probably never engage in this conversation mm. but hopefully they can feel like they're in it now they can feel like they're up the fly on the wall and with us yeah and this isn't the kind of normal I'm learning this for me it's it, I take it for granted sometimes this isn't normal conversation that men have no about life no, purpose no. and the fact that you're going to die and you've got regrets it's oh I think when you get older you do do you reckon oh I sat with my mate yesterday who's in the fire service he's just getting out and we were laughing. We were like, we were, we were laughing because we felt like we were like kids, <laughs> because we are. Yeah. And I said, do you know what? You know those middle middle aged guys that we used to look at. We're those middle aged guys now, and we were laughing together. Um, but yeah, so it, it, yeah, I just I think you're right though. I mean, yeah. And whether that's different, you might still feel like you could do more too, even though you've got these lists of things that you've conquered. That might just be a normal thing because life is. Span is so short and the world is so vast. So you might do everything that you could do in your 85, 90 years and still not do even a tiny bit of what you could have done. Yeah, I think, I think I'm think i kind of satisfied. I'm, I'm a bit different from you. I don't want to go tomorrow. But if I went tomorrow, I'd be okay. Okay, well, that's where I want to get to. I yeah. think that, that's, for me, that's an, that's an inspiration and that's a goal and an ambition. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, but I think you're a good person to do this because... If you're feeling that way, then you can be in touch with people who are sitting by us now, but really sitting at home. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. So well, the one thing, I mean, Mark, there's so many podcasts and stuff, and I thought the only thing that will make this slightly different is for me just to be totally honest. So, mm. yeah, I've improved my life tenfold, but there's still... But you are doing a great thing. This is what I'm trying to say to you. You know, people do listen to podcasts now mm. because they want... They, you know, I, I, I've been turned on to it. I never used to listen to it, but it is really interesting to hear people's different points of view, especially when they're honest about it. You can hear the bullshitters in life, mm -hmm. you know. And one thing we haven't really talked about, and I don't think we are going to talk about, and I don't want to talk about, is money. You know, nothing's been mentioned of money. I've told you, I've said how difficult it is getting the expeditions together, but that's just the process, you know. I have mm. to brand what I'm doing, make it, you know good for the sponsors and etc that's my work process yeah but it you know if i had a ferrari i'd sell it and buy and get you down to the south pole <laughs> you know that's the kind of thing yeah. it's you, you know i saw my my dad passing the start of last year and he was a hoarder and all the stuff he had in his house was stuff that he was proud of and i looked at it i looked at it as junk i feel horrible saying that but I did. And when he died and he was out of the house and I went around the house, it was his treasure. And I felt so sad that he created all this stuff in his life. And now it just didn't mean anything. And we, me and my brother, we took it to, um, you know, an, an auction place and got nothing for it. And we didn't, you know, we weren't looking for money for it, but it was, bless his soul, it wasn't worth anything. And he never he did i think he had a good life i think he my mom passed away 20 years ago at the age of 59 mm. which is terrible and he didn't recover from that you know he didn't he did i'll tell you what he didn't do and again this is probably a learned thing 
he didn't come to terms with it and he didn't speak to anybody about it so whenever we addressed mom dying he never he went oh yeah yeah and never really addressed it so he, he always lived in that moment and never got over it and i think that added to his dementia maybe i'm not medically minded in that sense but i think that was his demise from the 20 years ago um and he never created anything with his life apart from his own little community and yeah and stuff the reason Which i, I found was quite sad it, sure the reason i didn't ask about me one it didn't it didn't come to my mind but i think you kind of associate the lifestyle that you lead to somebody who doesn't particularly have money as a high value and driving a ferrari no. because you can see that from the life that you lead and it's i think that's what was refreshing as well seeing that um when i when i was doing my study it was like the experiences trump the items collected and i was like that's fucking cool Mm. Do you know what I mean that 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 appealed to me way more? So if you'd have had the sports cars that you've got on your Instagram and stuff, nah. But to mm. see you, you know, in these places that you know you don't really know exist, you know, you live in your own little world in mm. Coventry and Leamington, and you forget that there's areas where there's polar bears running around. You know, mm. I've never seen that shit. You know, so Just to see someone that that's that's been there and lived it, you're like, wow, there's there's there's, there's more out there. Yeah. I think you still need a nice home. You still need somewhere sure. to come to. And, you know, I still have things around me. You can't fit sledges in a Ferrari, by the way. That's why <laughs> I don't have a Ferrari. Uh, <laughs> that's the only reason. That's the only reason, yeah. <laughs> I've got the stuff that I've got home on my shelves that make me excited. I was, uh, we gave an Explorers, we did an Explorers Club event up in Dundee on board the Discovery, so Scott and Shackleton's old ship. So I created this event. We had speakers from the Titanic, Discovery, um, at Menson Band who discovered the endurance. You know, he came up and gave a talk. Um, and the guys at the museum gave me a, a block of wood from the Discovery because they're redoing it. And this, it was the original wood from the mm -hmm. Sh Scott and Shackleton ship. Mm -hmm. Now that sits on my desk at home. They're the kind of things that I like. You know, they're just like, wow, that's incredible. Mm. I've got polar bear tooth, you know, I've yeah. got all this sort of stuff. So, yeah, yeah my really house cool. is pretty weird with that. <laughs> no, I love it. Yeah. I love it. Um, we'll wrap this up in a minute. I just want to check that I haven't really... Mate, there's so much I could speak to you about. You'd be here for four or five hours. I'm do you sure know what I like do. about this talk? We haven't really talked too much about expiration. I know. <laughs> but that's perfect. Yeah. I, You know, because expiration is just the platform. Yeah. It's the person going you expirate adventure is about getting out and seeing the world but it's also rediscovering yourself uh -huh. so i think that's yeah. what we've done we've talked about that yeah well i'm interested in you too like that's my main thing so mm -hmm. i know that but the exploration is just something you do it's yeah it, do you know what i mean so i watched all those interviews and i'm sure you've been asked pretty much the same questions yeah but my interest is always like might work yeah what, you what I mean? makes you, you tick and yeah, stuff, yeah you and what you think and what mm. you is like all this you're good great. at this by the way so don't thank you, you. See a compliment you, you don't yeah do we like compliments it's weird i do try hard and i don't try hard yeah. so it's been it's very natural thing for me to do but that, that goes back to the curiosity mm. i'm fascinated so it's yeah it's really cool so uh, there's one final question that's a bit of a traditional Batman question if we can wrap up with that okay. it's a tough one how much is a pint of milk? Right, no, no, I won't ask you that. But uh, yeah, what do you need to, to work on now uh, in order to become what you might consider a better man? I think I need to socialise more, um, which is the complete irony of what I do. It's like Solo Explorer is the name of a book, you know, Solo 100 is the next expedition, Solo. But I think I'm losing the social skills um and the need to go out and spend time with people i've been people have said come out and we'll you know come out to this you know meal around someone's house or whatever and i just thought well i prefer to stay in and when i stay in i've got the tv on but i've got my little book there writing lists of kit and things to do so i'm constantly working on exploration so i think i really need to because because i saw my dad the sort of lose his social skills and loses the contact with other human beings i think the important thing is i need to start it's strange isn't it because we're having a great conversation here but it is about work mm. so to actually then go out and have a just a chat um and just to be sociable just be quiet in a room of people i don't mind doing that but working on my social skills 
It's funny. A lot it? of people would tell me that as well. Right. <laughs> the last guy who I had on, Joe, who's a boxer, a lovely lad. He's he's only thirty six. He said exactly the same thing. And I asked him, you know, do you feel like you do you want to, or do you feel like you you should? I think I should for the good of my health. For the good of your health. Yeah, yeah. because there's going to be a time. And I think it's going to be soon. I mean, all joking aside, we've, I've got the South Pole. Whether that happens or not, I don't know. And whether the, you know, I take everything as it comes. But there will be a time when my body will go, you know, you can't really pull sledging anymore, Mark. So I've got to slip into a different arena. And I've got, I've got plans for that. You know, that's how I operate. Mm -hmm. But I've got to be, I've got to think, you know, what do I want now moving into a different section of my life? And I think I've got to be a little bit more sociable, a little bit more sort of interactive. Are you excited about this next stage? Are you nervous? Are you unsure? How do you feel next about it? Next stage of my life. Yeah, when when the exp exploration comes to an end, for example. I I I felt sorry that my mum died just before sixty, because she. I want to experience every part of life and see what it's like. So I want to be old, and I want to be. I want to see how that feels and I want to try and use my ethics and that to try and embrace and enjoy as much as that as possible. And I know a lot of older people go, well, you're going to be sore and you're going to be grumpy. And I, I get that, I've, I, you know, but I just want to try and I want the opportunity, if the health will give it to me, mm. the opportunity to live a full life mm. as in age and then live a full life as in, mm. you know, I love I that attitude. I love that attitude. Mm. Is the is the old w when you reach that old age? Is that a number or is that just something you think there'll be a feeling where you, you <laughs> feel old, or do you say sixty five is old and boom? Well, when I was a kid, twenty five was old. <laughs> you know, the teachers at school were twenty five, and they looked like, you know, they looked Crazy. really old. I know. But now, oh. now I'm fifty six. I'm big actually <laughs> sitting with my mate yesterday. We did feel quite old. Um, but it's kind of a nice relax. You kind of know who you are. You know yeah. Yeah. that you don't look great in the mirror. You know what I mean? You don't. You know that things don't fit you that well anymore. But it's just kind of funny because you don't give a monkey's ass about it. You know what I mean? It's it's kind of you get to a, a point where you just know who you are, and it's lovely. It's it's a lovely feeling to be. I I read something <laughs> brilliant the other day that said the only way you'll ever beat anxiety is to have the humour to laugh at it like you've just said yeah. Like, yeah yeah things don't fit me as good as they and if you can't laugh you're going to be seriously down and depressed yeah it's yeah it's kind of the only yeah as i say to kids the only things that stop in your life the only things that stop you from having a good time in life is yourself mm -hmm. you know um there's restrictions everywhere with that and there's a long debatable conversation about that statement but generally you are in you are in control of who you are as a person you know respectfully and stuff mm -hmm. whatever you know i think we're getting a little bit <laughs> that was a big deal for me Thanks, thank buddy. you i really um, enjoyed that good so did i um i, I was super excited and it's it's not disappointed it mm. was it was brilliant what i want to do if possible is stay in touch because after the expedition that would be worth talking about how how that process of being on ice for a hundred days yeah um and then um you know we should stay in touch about the south pole as well whether it's from a Looks psychology it. side of understanding or, or whatever it might sure. be okay yeah so I'd lo I'd love so when do you start your trip um, march, march the well it'll be the first of march i'll be moving up into position and then any time sort of 20th onwards i'll cool. be sort so of back in the june you, you should be should be safe and sound oh, yeah. uh, at the end of march i definitely want to be out on ice for a week at least yeah so march april yeah. May. yeah okay cool thank you man that was awesome thank you appreciate cool. it let's just hope the let's just hope the technology has uh, been all right <laughs> you did but, press play didn't you i press record <laughs> I've done, i think I, I think i've done my job so. that'd cool. be 